You're listening to Ion Health on Dubai Eye 103.8. Delving into your overall well-being. With Arab Health, united by business, forging ahead. Continuing our discussion today on Ion Health, we're joined now by Dr. Mahmoud Tabal. He's the Chief of Surgery at Al Zara Hospital. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I think you've chosen some of the most difficult cancers to treat, pancreatic cancers, notoriously aggressive and, and quick. Um, can you tell us a little bit why sure. why you've chosen to pursue those fields and the impact that, that your kind of care is having on patients? It's, it's some kind of interest. Um, I like working in this uh, area. Um, my passion was always to work in, uh, in, in around the liver and the hepatobiliary system. And um, uh, it, it started when, um, when I was in medical school. Um, I got interested when um, there are any cases like this. Uh, but then uh, when I pursued my career, I started in transplantation. Uh, most of the hepatobiliary surgeons are transplant surgeons as well, but I started with the transplant, which is the more difficult part. Uh, and then I got more um, uh, fascinated with it. <laughs> and then I got uh, into the field of cancer as well, treatment in addition to transplantation, um, and mainly in these areas. It's a nice area for me to work in as a, as a, um, as a surgeon. And I see that... Um, the surgeon who deals with this uh, kind of disease and this, this, these uh, organs um, uh, is, is actually capable of, of dealing with many other um, uh, areas in the body. So that's my, my vision, how, how I look at it. And uh, uh, here I am now. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about perhaps things that you're excited about that we could be seeing in, uh, in operating theatres, clinics when it comes to cancer care in, in the near future? When we talk about cancer care, it's not a, um, a small subject. It's a very huge subject, and it starts from um, how to counsel patients and how to to start with how to prevent it. Um, because now the most important thing is the screening programs and the preventive me- methods or measures that we do. Uh, and um, UAE with the, with the new uh, uh, vision and healthcare also they are implementing this uh, widely uh, as we have seen uh, definitely you were involved in that as well in October the breast awareness month uh, or breast cancer awareness month everybody was talking about screening and then last month there was different uh, types of of cancer also awareness uh, including the pancreas and we have been trying a lot to um, uh, tell people um, how to to think about um, these cancers and how to try to avoid uh, getting them, and if uh, God forbid you have you have cancer, we are trying to uh, detect it early because early treatment is the key of, of cure for these for for uh, cancer patients. When we start with uh, preventive measures, uh, we move in, uh, on into uh, how to treat patients, and um, uh, as we as you mentioned, one of the important things is the emotional treatment. Um, so this is the first thing to to deal with, and then how to convince the patient that you still have a hope. Cancer is not only about um, uh, just giving medicine or or taking the patient uh, to theater and and doing surgery. It's also about giving the confidence in the patient uh, that you will be treated and you will be cured. Mm -hmm. And um, personally, and I tell it to my patients, if if you are not optimistic, uh, if you are so afraid or frightened, I really cannot treat you. Because I had, I had experiences with patients who were like this. Things went smooth, straightforward, but complications happened. And up to even death. Patients have to have the, the, the confidence in themselves that they will be treated and they will be cured. Regarding the improvement that we have, it's in different fields. Um, if we talk about surgery, there are many aspects of surgical improvement. Um, but I think we should uh, start from the beginning. Um, of diagnosis Mm -hmm. of the disease, of uh, treating it medically, of making sure that we have multidisciplinary approach for the patients in order to get the best treatment uh, protocols for them. And um, then moving into surgery, which is the main hope of cure for the patients. So let's let's start a little bit with screening because sometimes it's uh, it's as, as straightforward as you know a man or a woman in a gloved hand, and then sometimes it is a huge amount of uh, of technology as well. And we've seen a huge push from the UA government, of course, when it comes to uh, screening education initiatives. But somehow, you know, messages just are not 
getting to people that need them perhaps so there's there's cultural barriers there might be education barriers um when it comes to tech is there anything that you are particularly uh interested in when it comes to that screening side that we could perhaps be seeing in clinic or at Alzara sometime soon? I would say before we talk about uh, screening, we have to educate the, the people about uh, cancer. And education, it does not mean that we tell you that you have, if you have cancer, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. Education is how to not have cancer. So education is very important. Um, and and uh, if we get into this level, then we can decrease the risk factors that might um, uh, prevent um, having cancer. Um, uh, in our hospital, in Azahra Hospital, we're just planning, and I just signed the paper uh, a few days ago, planning to start um, a screening program on a wide basis. Anyone can come, and if he wants to be screened for any kind of common cancer, not breast, not pancreas, not liver, anything, uh, there is a package that we can, we, we're going to do, including tumor markers, and including some images, some other uh, tests, and that will be uh, good enough for the patient uh, to, to uh, detect. Because I think for so many people, it's that fear factor, isn't it? It's the, oh, my, my grandfather had this, my friend had that, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you do too. <clears throat> I dream of a time where we can just step into some kind of booth that we, a, bit, a bit like a, a bit like a fake tan spray booth and a, a laser will scan you and go there's the problem we'll just pop in and get that <laughs> and you just do that once a month or you know every six months like when you go to the dentist and then you go and see someone such as yourself and they go okay we've identified this problem but don't worry we've got it right at the very beginning so it's it's not going to develop and maybe that will be the case in hundreds of years time but right now it's more complicated than that it's much more complicated so it can be it can be it can be happening when you're uh, when you have strong family history or you have some genetic predisposition. So we, we do sometimes genetic screening. Uh, and that's another thing that can be done. But this is for selective people. It's mm. not for everyone. When we're talking about general, like, uh, uh, po uh, population or whole population screening, it's uh, it has to be more general, not, not specified. But um, this is one thing. But there are tests like we do for cancer patients that are already diagnosed, like the nuclear medicine, nuclear tests, like, uh, for example, PET scan, what we call it, PET scan, it screens the whole body and it uh, uptakes the, the um, there is uptake of this nuclear material in the cancer cells. Uh, but we don't do it for every uh, person. It's not, it's not uh, practical, to be honest. But I think um, so many people, unfortunately, live in fear of you know, finding something or what, if they do find a lump, not knowing what to do about it. Or they've never been, there have been conversations in their household about about this there's still such an, an awfully long way to go in opening up the conversation in in certain certain communities certain families and i do think having conversations like this on on national radio does go some way to kind of breaking the stigma and taboo and fear factor as well do you not find yourself doctor when you're out and about if you see someone smoking or you see someone who's hugely overweight do you not want to go over and just have a little chat my personality if i'm not dealing with my patient is a little <laughs> bit uh, uh, not protective i would say just out of respect i don't want to interfere uh, i would ask the same though question my to wife, my <laughs> <laughs> though my wife if she's with me she will do she will go and she will tell him just uh throw it please <laughs> <laughs> my husband deals with transplants all the time and well can i actually ask you about the, about the transplant situation because i'm from the uk and we hear the most horrendous headlines about how long it takes for a diagnosis how long it takes to be a you know on in transplant um queues um what is the situation here in the uae can you explain what, to kind of lift the lid a little bit if someone is in need of, of a liver transplant for example what's the process like here so we have to be practical. Um, so I, I just came to UAE or to Dubai uh, three or four months ago. Oh, welcome. And uh, Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I've been working in, in big centers in transplant before. Uh, and one of the reasons um, I, I was brought to, to Dubai is with the vision of having liver transplant, maybe not in a specific hospital, but as a program. But to be uh, more practical, we only have one center doing liver transplant in, in the country. Um, and this is um, uh, not enough. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job. But uh, when you have more patients and you have more demand, you will need more, more centers. And this is what they are working on now. So if a patient needs liver transplant, um, the best thing is to have a donor 
uh, or, or a kidney transplant, let's be more like widen, mm-hmm. widen the, the subject. So you need a donor, a living donor, someone who's relative to you um, in order to make it easier and faster. If you want to be on the list waiting for, for a, an organ, that will take some time because we don't have, we're still in the, in the phase of promoting uh, people to uh, donate their organs and, and uh, after death and, and get into uh, um, widespread like um, a donation program. Yeah, to establish uh, so that. Okay. So, from so, deceased donors, it's going to take a while. It's not, it's not a, a quick that, thing. So. That's interesting. So this is still something that is being established and um, I guess promoted, as, as, as you say. Um, my best friend from school, her mum, next week is donating a kidney to her dad. So by some, oh wow, this is fantastic. <laughs> I know, but but by it, it's an incredible coincidence, I guess that you know the, the a married couple is a match. It really, really is. But she's obviously very nervous about it. Can I ask you why did you choose to move to the UAE? As you say, you've been with some big centres internationally. You've been here just three or four months. What have you recognised in the region that you think is particularly exciting? Um, honestly. <laughs> It's actually um, the reason of your interview today. It's the vision that they have. They have a good vision. Um, and I think uh, there is a chance of, uh, of um, having a UAE health system into um, uh, high standards. And actually, now we're, we're uh, almost there, but we need some time in order to uh, show to people that we have all of this in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's, it's a wonderful country with uh, all facilities and um, uh, all all uh, capabilities of being um, um, in the leading countries of, of uh, healthcare. So that's that's the main reason. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bala. Really appreciate it. It's fantastic to have you in the region. Again, really exciting to see some of the issues that you are tackling, some of the opportunities that you're presenting, and see where we get to in the near future as part of that UAE's national vision for becoming the real forefront of cancer care and healthcare in general uh, globally. So have a wonderful weekend ahead. Really, really appreciate your time. More with Ion Health coming up on Dubai Eye 103.8.